stakeholders along the way. Uh, it's proceeded independently of any influence by the federal government. We've been able to witness a progression of policy that holds the state's education system to higher expectations with the interest of graduating more students ready for college, career, and citizenship. And the driving force have been, as, as all you all are, Ohio policymakers who care. A key takeaway from this history is that this work isn't always easy. It's hard. Change is hard. Change takes time. Teachers get frustrated. <coughs> parents get frustrated. Students get frustrated. But with time and support, the new requirements become easier, and we begin to see the improvements from the changes that were made. It's also worth noting throughout this entire period that at no time was there a state law or other legal requirement that schools use any specific curriculum. Districts and schools have always had, and continue to have, complete freedom with regard to the adoption of curriculum, textbooks, and instructional materials. So I'm going to turn it over to Susan now to talk about the Common Core uh, and the implications of the legislation you are considering today. So this Ohio story is not a unique one. This type of activity was happening in states all across the country. And with so many policy areas, states talk to each other. Governors talk to each other. State superintendents talk to each other. And as they did this, had this conversation and discussed the challenges of moving their education systems forward as they did that, they quickly came to realize that there were a lot of things that they could share, um, they could learn from each other, and put into practice from state to state. And fundamentally, reading and writing in California for students is not that different from reading and writing in Colorado or math in Illinois, not that different from math, math in North Carolina. Students are graduating in a state and going to college there, or going to college or work in another state. But state leaders, who are competitive by nature, want to know that their students, where do they stand academically relative to other states? And the power, they know the power of state comparisons to be able to motivate improvement, and they understand the need for higher standards to make sure that their students are continuing um, to have more and more of them crossing an important bar or being ready for what's next for them after high school. They also started to recognize the inherent unfairness of defining proficient differently from state to state. And I don't know if you've heard the old um, homage, thank gosh, for, uh, ten, uh, for in, uh, Mississippi, because Mississippi was always at the bottom of the heap when we would look at, at these state comparisons. But it was really about where are we relative to other states in terms of our talent base, because business cared about that political <coughs> talent base. And where talent, knowledge, and skills exist is where we will have an opportunity for ongoing and significant um, job opportunities that will keep us strong. But many of these realizations emerged, and also the imperative was set for a set of common standards. Not all subjects, not all across everything, but really two, English and mathematics. That would set a high standard that would be internationally competitive and comparable across states, so that the direction at the direction of governors and state school superintendents, the National Governors Association and CCSSO, began to work on the idea of developing a common set of core standards in English language arts and mathematics. These discussions started in 2008 and the work began in 2009. Now these organizations work at the direction of state leaders. They're not independent organizations. They don't have the liberty to engage in work that's not supported by a majority of their members who are state officials. It's been suggested that NGA and CCSSO do not reflect states working together. But nothing could be further from the truth. Additionally, by working together and benchmarking the standards to the best in the world, the governors ensured that the standards would not simply be high, but they would be reflecting consensus around the lowest common denominator, so that we didn't fall into a trap of lowest common denominator. The processes used by NGA and CSSO and the chief, who was acting as a manager in this work, were designed to be open to public review and also feedback. Specifically, the Common Core State Standards drafts were released for public comment in September in 2009. Almost 10,000 comments were received, and a subsequent round of draft standards were shared with the public in March 2010. The Ohio Department of Education posted the standards on its website and conducted 18 meetings around the state in March and April of that year for the public to ask questions and provide feedback around the standards. And they were also presented to Ohio's House and Senate Education Committees in May 2010. And then the Common Core State Standards were finally released publicly in June 2010 and shortly after adopted by the State Board of Education. 
Something important to note here also is that the 10,000 comments don't only represent individual person's comments. They also re represent the combined comments of many organizations who convened their members, many districts who convened their teachers, in order to put forward, to review and put forward comments on the standards. So there's a number of myths that are circulating around the Common Core that we'd like to take the opportunity to set straight, and that we've included in an addendum to this testimony to further clarify some things. First, English language arts and mathematics. The Common Core standards are limited to mathematics and English language arts. Those are the two sets of standards that have been um, developed um, under the Common Core banner. There may be other um, standards developed by other groups, but for Common Core, it's really just these two. These two comment, content areas represent the primary focuses of colleges and universities when engaging a student's readiness to succeed in college um, and also to succeed in work in many of the career training programs that students will enter after they leave high school. So nothing in the Common Core limits states from having standards in other areas, and Ohio does. Um, our Ohio's new learning standards are uniquely Ohio, and the state has chosen to supplement um, with you know, uh, social studies, science, and other non-core uh, subjects like fine arts, financial literacy, physical education, on and on. Exceeding the standards. There is no limitation on moving beyond the standards. Schools are free to teach math beyond Algebra II and English language arts beyond the level specified in the standards. And in fact, in the addendum to the standards, you will find pathways for how to make that happen because there have been some really important points made about um, STEM careers and are we really making sure that students can progress all the way through calculus in high school, and those opportunities are there. In fact, um, the standards document states, I quote, while the standards focus on what's most essential, they do not describe all that can be or should be taught. A great deal is left to the discretion of teachers and curriculum developers. The aim of the standards is to articulate the fundamentals, not to set out an exhaustive list or set of restrictions that limits what can be taught from what is written herein, unquote. The real problem, however, is that not enough students are reaching basic standards for entering college. In 2013, ACT reported that 31% of Ohio high school graduates taking the ACT met none of the college-ready benchmarks. Standards are not curriculum. Standards in no way dictate curriculum. They still will be, there still will be schools for the arts, science academies, foreign language immersion programs, electronic schools. Every flavor of school and instructional approach that exists today can and will continue under the Common Core because nothing prohibits them from existing. Districts and teachers can choose from a wide array of curricular approaches, resources, materials, and are free to create their own. Teachers and school districts develop their own reading lists of appropriate books and literature for their students. These are not prescribed by the standards. The standards documents actually state, quote, these standards do not dictate curriculum or teaching methods, unquote, and, quote, by emphasizing required achievements, the standards leave room for teachers, curriculum developers, and states to determine how those goals should be reached and what additional topics should be addressed. Thus, the standards do not mandate such things as a particular writing process or the full range of metacognitive strategies that students may need to monitor and direct their thinking and learning. Teachers are thus free to provide students with whatever tools and knowledge their professional judgment and experience identify as most helpful for meeting the goals set out in the standards." Unquote. No federal involvement. The standards were not developed by the federal government. They were developed by states for states with the support of state and gubernatorial organizations. Nor were any federal funds used in their development. The Common Core standards in no way centralize or nationalize public education. Not all states have adopted them. States, districts, schools, and teachers retain control over what happens in the classroom per the laws and traditions of each state. And as always has been the case, schools and districts can be challenged by implementation choices. Some of the materials, worksheets, and assignments we've seen in the press or heard about in these hearings are a result of implementation decisions, not the standards themselves. And as schools and teachers gain experience with the standards and the materials that work best for them and their students, these issues will be resolved over time. 